Well, this morning, as we turn together to God's Word, we're returning to the new series of messages that we began last Sunday that I'm calling Embracing and Living Our Identity. And throughout this series, we're walking together through the shorter New Testament letter of 1 Peter. Uh, And this book is only five chapters long. It's not all that long. And it's tucked way at the end of our New Testament, so way toward the end of the Bible. So if you'd like to follow along, which is a great idea, it, it may just be easiest to use the table of contents. But it's tucked way toward the end of the Bible. And these five chapters are full of teaching on living as a Christian in the midst of a world that isn't Christian. Now, I'd put it this way. First Peter teaches us how to live as a Christian in a world that isn't. Or you might say in the midst of a world that isn't. And, and more than that, this letter gives us a hopeful, eternal perspective that enables us to live with hope in a broken world. And last Sunday, we considered a surprising description of our Christian identity as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ as we read the first words of the book. Verse 1 of chapter 1, there's this phrase, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion. Uh, Brothers and sisters in Christ, our identity is that of exiles or sojourners. Christians are different. We're citizens of heaven, and we await our heavenly inheritance. This world is not our ultimate home. And being different, and Christians are different, can and often does produce a level of friction and even opposition from the outside world from those who simply don't understand. That's why we're described as exiles. Now, continuing through the book, in chapter uh, 1, verses 3 through 12, we'll find ourselves considering together the joyful reality of what's described as living hope. Uh, Our incorruptible uh, heavenly inheritance, our salvation. So we'll be looking at living hope, uh, our incorruptible uh, heavenly inheritance, and our salvation, these glorious realities. And as we gaze on these realities, we'll see that Considering the reality of our salvation provides us with a hopeful, eternal perspective that enables us, again, to live with hope in the midst of this broken world. Our living hope transforms our perspective on uh, on all kinds and varieties of temporary difficulties and sufferings that we may encounter. Uh, Now, the letter of 1 Peter Uh, can be accurately described as both challenging and encouraging all at the same time. And these uh, concepts of challenge and encouragement are very much intertwined. They're wrapped around one another, and you can't separate them. Uh, So in this passage, we're going to find joyful encouragement and challenge and honesty about suffering all at once and all together wrapped around one another. And uh, this passage is a very densely packed passage. So we'll have to read some parts of it more than once because it's really, uh, it reads like some run-on sentences, though our modern translations add some more punctuation. It's really one idea after another, after another, after another, after another. Uh, Really fast. And so much is intertwined in these passages, uh, in these these verses. So I'd like to read the passage. This is chapter 1, verses 3 through 12. And as I read, uh, prepare yourself that there is a lot here. It's one idea after another. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith, for a salvation ready to, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, which is, uh, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in uh, praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him 
and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be, uh, the grace that was to be yours searched, intent, uh, searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Gazing on our hope transforms our understanding of present difficulties. Uh, I'm sure you would, you'd agree, and, and think with me here, but I'm sure you'd agree that everyone needs hope. And that you would also say, and probably right after that, you'd be quick to agree with me, that hope is often in short supply. And with that in mind, I want you to think with me about circumstances that we all, that we all encounter, or that maybe you personally encounter, that if allowed to, could rob us of our hope. It might be the situation around the world. Is it the reality of war in the misery and grief that it brings. How about famine? The seemingly endless instability that we hear about. Or the parade of natural disasters and the difficulty that follows, the destruction and difficulty that follows in their wake that we hear about so often. Perhaps, and I'm just being honest, in an election year in the United States, is it fear that things might not go the way we'd or you'd, you'd personally like politically that can rob us of hope or maybe closer to home very personally? A cancer diagnosis or some other very difficult health challenge? The loss of a job, or the concern of the loss of a job. Or a difficult and painful dynamic within your family that's just hard to even describe. It could be mild persecution or opposition because of living as a Christian. It could be almost anything. And all of these things, and so much more, are challenging. And they involve a level of suffering. And I trust that with many of the things I've described, if not all of them, you, many of us personally identify and know exactly how that feels. And you would probably also acknowledge that if these things were allowed to, they could rob us of our hope. They shouldn't be allowed to, but they could drain our hope. And the passage that we're looking at speaks to all of these situations. Because when we consider our heavenly inheritance, our present sufferings are set in an entirely different context. Notice, I didn't say they go away, but I said they're set in an entirely different context than when they're faced apart from a gospel perspective. Gazing on our hope transforms our perspective. When we consider the wonder of our salvation... Brothers and sisters, the only fitting response is praise. Praise God for our living hope. Considering our salvation, singing about our salvation, all of that leads into worship, it leads to praise. It's the only fitting response. Listen again to verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And verse 3 and the following verses are tremendously densely packed. And we need to slow down and take a close look at several different and connected concepts. And the first way I want to do that is I want to read verses 3 through 5 from a different translation that's a little bit more paraphrase oriented. This is the New Living Translation. And I'd invite you and encourage you to allow this different way of saying the same thing to help the truth to sink in. All praise to God, 
the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his, it is by His great mercy that we have been born again, because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation, and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in, that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. Can you see and feel how densely packed these verses are? I'd like for us to consider four phrases or concepts here. The Lord's great mercy, new birth or being born again, living hope, and our heavenly inheritance. And let's unpack each of these concepts a little bit, one at a, one as a, one at a, one at a time, as we walk through this passage. Ponder these words. Just allow them to sink in. Ponder them. According to his great mercy. Mercy implies not getting what we deserve. Imagine, and maybe you know the experience, that you're driving down the road and your speed was allowed to creep up. Maybe you didn't even notice, then again, maybe you did. And then suddenly, the next thing you know, maybe you know exactly what I'm talking about, you know this experience, you have flashing lights in your rearview mirror. Do you know that sinking feeling? Now imagine the police officer appears at your window and asks you, do you know how fast you were going? And then for whatever reason, the officer decides to let you go with a warning. That's mercy, isn't it? That's mercy. Mercy implies not getting what we deserve. And to understand and to begin to ponder God's great mercy, we need to consider our default sinful human condition. Uh, and I want to call our attention to a couple of passages that show us the horror, and I do mean horror, of our sin. Romans 3, 10 and 11. None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. And then the theme of sin continues, Romans 3.23. Our students that have been a part of Awana probably know this. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Or from the Old Testament, Isaiah 53 and verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And then, of course, prophetically pointing forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. This is all bad news in its reality, right? Not the fact that the Lord has laid the iniquity on him, uh, you know, it, that Jesus died as our substitute, but the reality of sin is bad news. And then we have a taste of the good news there in Isaiah 53 and verse 6. But we need to face the painful reality that is right before us. As sinners, we do not deserve to be born again to a living hope. What we deserve is judgment because of a rebellion against our Creator. We deserve hell. And it's only according to God's great mercy that there is a way of escaping what we justly deserve for our sins. That's contained in that phrase, according to His great mercy. Uh, apart from what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross through his death and resurrection, we are under God's wrath because of our sin and utterly hopeless. Ephesians 2.1 paints an awful picture, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Did you catch that word? Dead. Uh, the bad news, friends, is very countercultural. And I understand that. People are not generally good. I think that's what most people want to believe. I know that that's what's popular, is to say I believe in the goodness of humanity. Or that I'm a good person. But these phrases, the goodness of humanity, or I'm a good person, are woefully mistaken. They are wrong. They are horribly misleading and totally incorrect. 
The reality is we're sinners by nature and by choice. The theological terminology is the words total depravity. Apart from God, we can do nothing good. We need to be saved. Our default is not just bad. It's worse than the word bad describes. And what we deserve for sin is death. And all of this brings us to the next reality to unpack. Now, I would pause and you say, everything you're just describing about the horror of our sin is, is a hard thing to swallow. That may be, but it makes perfect sense of the world around us. When we turn on any news outlet for a minute and we see the horror of sin, and then we look into our own hearts and we see the horror of sin, and we recognize that though it is hard to face, the reality of our sinful nature describes the situation perfectly. It's true. And we need to face it. We need to be saved. Well, let's bring this a step farther. With that bad news, listen to these words found in verse 3. He has caused us to be born again. You know that common question that people ask, but they probably don't want an answer? How are you doing? And, you know, the response is to look away and say fine or something like that. Don't do that. You know, listen. But there's truth to this answer. Infinitely better than I deserve. That's grace and mercy. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, how are you doing? infinitely, dramatically, indescribably better than we deserve. That's truth. And that should cause a smile. We don't deserve it, but God in his great mercy has given us new birth. Now, at first glance, the idea of being born again is hard to wrap our minds around. And these words, of course, take us back to John chapter 3 and to Jesus' conversation with a Pharisee, a leader of the Pharisees, as a matter of fact, named Nicodemus one night. And Nicodemus, like many of us, had a hard time wrapping his mind around Jesus' teaching on being born again. But Jesus insisted that he must understand that being born again is absolutely essential. This is John 3, 3. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then John 3, 5. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Just as each of us has been born naturally, we need to be born spiritually. We must be born again. We, must be sa- we need to be saved from our sins, to have eternal life, uh, and we must be born again to experience that forgiveness, that salvation from our sins, to have eternal life, to have a heavenly inheritance. To have those things, we must be born again. We must believe in Jesus to save us from our sins. Probably some of the best-known words in the entire Bible, John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Did you catch the word perish? We must believe in him so that we don't perish. And then verse 17. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The moment we placed our faith and trust In Jesus Christ, in Him alone, to save us, we were born again. And at that moment, we received eternal life, living hope. So ask yourself, have I personally received the offer of eternal life? To use the words of John 3, 17, very specifically, ask yourself, am I saved? We really need to consider that. Now, new birth into an eternal inheritance makes us an exile because it redefines our relationship with God, most importantly, but also our relationship with the society because we become citizens of heaven. And there again is that idea of being sojourners or exiles. And with that in mind, let's turn our attention to this next concept, that specifically of living hope. It's been said that 1 Peter's foremost theme is hope in the midst of suffering. And living hope 
uh, can be defined as the eager, confident expectation of the life to come. It's hope that's alive and growing. And, and, and living things grow. Think about it. A plant that is living will grow. Uh, a, a dead one doesn't. But living things grow. This is hope that's alive and growing. It, it has a growing expectation of our heavenly inheritance. And it's based on the fundamental reality that on the basis of Jesus' resurrection, we too will be resurrected. Living hope is all about eternal life and possessing eternal life out to fill us with hope no matter what circumstances we're facing. Now, I do have to pause here and make an important definition. The way hope is normally talked about in the Bible and the way we talk about hope are really two different things. We use the phrase saying, I hope it works out, and it's kind of a wish, if you will, but it's, it's so uncertain. Uh, I hope that my team wins the game. Biblical hope is, is entirely different. It describes a certainty based on the promises of God. Certain hope, it will happen. Not a, a wish of what maybe. Uh, that's how we use the word hope, but when the Bible talks about hope, it's talking about certain hope. It's talking about something that depends on the promises of God that will be. God keeps his promises. Now listen, uh, now continuing to think about this, the phrase, our heavenly inheritance, listen again to verses 4 and 5. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So did you catch the enormity of what's said here? Believers, by God's mercy, have been born again into a living hope, and we have a secure heavenly inheritance that is kept safe by God. And here, when it talks about salvation ready to be revealed in the last time, we need to understand that in the Bible, salvation is talked about in three different time periods, past, present, and future. We have been saved, our conversion. There was the hour we first believed. We are being saved, sanctification, and we will be saved at Jesus Christ's glorious return, glorification. Uh, the big words, justification, sanctification, glorification. Conversion, the hour I first believed. Ongoing, growing in our walk with Jesus, and then ultimately the day of Christ's return. So it says salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That's what it's talking about, is that final glorification when Christ returns. And our salvation is guarded, and that's actually a military term in Greek, by God himself until Jesus returns. Well, friends, this is the best news ever, and it provides hope no matter what our circumstances are, whether they're good or, or bad or tremendously ugly. We have a heavenly inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Our heavenly inheritance is, without a doubt, completely safe because God is guarding it. Now you say, Pastor Dave, do you believe that all true believers will persevere to the end? So in that sense, once saved, always saved. Yes, I do. And why do I believe that all true believers will make it to the end? Because God preserves them. Perseverance is the word we often talk about, but perseverance depends on preservation. God is guarding. If it depended on us, we'd be in a whole lot of trouble because we fail so many more times than we even know. Preservation. Guarding, God guarding our salvation. Now, now think about it. Just kind of try to ponder these words a little bit more. Imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. And compare that with everything in this world. Our heavenly inheritance is very different from any inheritance we might receive in this life. I trust we would all agree. Think about it. We normally talk about an inheritance in the terms of money, right? Somebody inherits some money. Money and material possessions are temporary and uncertain. They certainly are not unfading. You can receive an inheritance of a large sum of money and mismanage it, and it will be gone very, very quickly. You want a biblical example of that? Think of the parable of the lost or prodigal son who squandered his wealth. Now, the Old Testament background of an inheritance was the land of Israel, each of the tribes, the 12 tribes' allotment of land. Our inheritance is in heaven. 
so much greater. You might inherit a house, but if you just leave a house empty, what happens? It falls apart, right? If, if you just leave something unmaintained, it will perish and fade. We know that abandoned buildings don't keep their value. But this is imperishable, un, uh, unfading. And in John 14, verses 1 through 3, we actually sang some of these words. Jesus comforts his disciples uh, right before the final road leading up to the cross, his arrest in the garden, and then the final road to the cross. And he comforts his disciples with these words, talking about the same concept. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. Jesus says that he's going to prepare a place uh, for all believers, to prepare our heavenly inheritance. Uh, the reality of eternal life is the foundation of our hope. And with that in mind, let's keep moving and look at the truth that living hope gives us joy even in the midst of trials and difficulties. A clear view of our secure heavenly inheritance provides joy even in times of trial. In verses 6 through 9, we pick up the theme of hope in the midst of suffering and trial. Listen again to verse 6. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. As followers of Jesus, we can greatly rejoice in suffering, persecution, and trials because we have living hope. This is not a shallow answer to the problem of suffering. This does not ignore pain and suffering. It rather focuses on the reality of our secure heavenly inheritance. So how can verse 6 speak about rejoicing in the midst of suffering? And the short answer, if you're looking in your Bible, is because of verses 3 through 5. Think about it. Because we have living hope, because we have an inheritance in heaven, because of the gospel, this perspective ought to transform how we see and process things. Perseverance through trials will demonstrate that our faith is genuine and at the final judgment, it will result in a well done, well done, good and faithful servant from the Lord himself. So we should be filled with joy even in the midst of suffering because as believers, we're receiving the goal of our faith, the salvation of our souls. I didn't say that we should be filled with joy because of the suffering, but even, with, even in it. Nobody wants to suffer, but even in suffering, we're receiving the goal of our faith, the salvation of our souls. Even in the midst of painful trials, we should be filled with joy, the joy of our salvation, the joy of knowing that we have an inheritance in heaven. And these glorious truths ought to fill us with joy no matter what we're facing. But I'm sure that some of us are hearing everything I'm saying, and you're saying in the back of your mind, now wait a minute. And none of us like pain, so you might be thinking, isn't this business about joy, even in the midst of suffering, a little bit odd? And I would say to you gently, no, not really. I want you to think with me. You undergo a knee replacement surgery or some other orthopedic surgery. Some of you have been there. You know exactly what I'm talking about. It's an unpleasant and painful thing that you're going to have to undergo, this surgery. And then the doctor makes it clear that you'll need to go through physical therapy to regain strength and motion after the surgery. And this proposition that the doctor is setting before you is one of, that's expensive in pain, time, and money. Maybe you know exactly what I'm talking about. Why do you endure the pain of physical therapy? Or perhaps, why did you, for a season of time, work two jobs? So after a full day of work, you went to work another job so that you could get out of debt. Or why did you work jobs to, get you, to, to put yourself through uh, college or some other training? Why, why did you do that? Why do we persevere? 
Because we look forward to the end result. So it's like when we fix our eyes on the glory of heaven and know the end of the story, it changes our perspective. Remember how Jesus comforted his disciples in John 14. He focused them on the reality of their heavenly inheritance. He didn't take away the painful circumstances. Jesus went to the cross and praised God that he did. And, and, and one more important point needs to be made about all of this as we look uh, at the reality of suffering and trials. Uh, God uses trials, difficult experiences, to grow us. And we see that in the pages of the New Testament. This is Romans 5, 3 through 4. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Or James 1, verses 2 through 4. Count it all joy, my brothers or brothers and sisters, by application, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. God often uses suffering to grow and strengthen us, to grow our faith. So adjust your perspective and say, our sufferings are not wasted. And as a matter of fact, as gold is refined in the fire, as gold is heated up, the, way, the uh, byproducts that are often mixed in with gold, the impurities, are separated from the pure gold. God uses trials to grow us. And then as we conclude in verses 10 through 12, we come to a little bit of a side trip of, of sorts in the flow of the passage. Verse 9 concludes with these words, obtaining the outcome of your faith, get this, the salvation, that's a key word, of your souls. And then verse 10 begins, concerning the salvation, the prophets. Can you hear the link? It's all about salvation. And then the passage reminds us that the Old Testament prophets who predicted Christ's coming we're not primarily serving themselves, but us. And what does this mean? It means that our perspective is fuller than the Old Testament prophets who looked forward to Christ's coming. The prophets, through the Holy Spirit, prophesied about Christ's coming, but didn't have all the details. They only had the details that God chose to give them, and their words are a tremendous blessing to us who have the benefit of looking back at God's promises before they occurred. It's an enormous privilege to live in the Christian era. We can see how everything fits together. We look back and see how everything points to Jesus. The entire Old Testament points forward to Him. So if you ever wish that you lived in the days of the Old Testament prophets, ponder this, they wanted our seats. They wanted to see what we see. Let me give you an example. I want to give one example from the Old Testament prophet of Isaiah that makes this point. This is Isaiah 53, verses uh, 4 through 6. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is a prophetic picture of the cross. Pointing forward to Jesus' death. The prophet Isaiah was not serving himself, but us. Prophesying hundreds and hundreds of years before about Christ's death. So we've covered a lot of ground. We've gazed in wonder on what God has done for us, and we found ourselves praising Him for living hope. Considering the reality of our salvation provides us with a hopeful eternal perspective, enabling us to live with hope and with, live with joy in a broken world, our living hope transforms our perspective on all kinds of varieties of temporary difficulties and sufferings. So let's come full circle and ask yourself again, what robs you of hope? And I encourage you to see that in the light of an eternal perspective. To see that in the light of God's great mercy. To see that in light of being born again, living hope, our inheritance. That said, I do have to quickly address the possibility that some of us here might not yet have this living hope. 
We might not yet have personally been born again. We might not yet be able to say, I'm saved. We might not yet have personally responded to and received God's great mercy. If this is you, the message at the absolute center of the Bible can be summed up this way. If you hear anything that I say this morning, hear this. There's bad news and good news. And the bad news is this. All of us are sinners, we're rebels against God, and we're completely unable to save ourselves. That's the bad news. We're headed to hell. The good news is glorious. God sent his son. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 6.23 So if you haven't yet, I encourage you to personally, in your own heart, take the step of acknowledging your sin and receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Receive forgiveness of your sins, eternal life, living hope. In your own words, turn your life over to the Savior right now. I'd encourage you that you could pray something like this in your own words. This, don't pray these exact words. You could, but pray what is in your heart as you make a commitment to the Lord. But this is uh, the words that Josh McDowell prayed, and he writes this in his book, More Than a Carpenter, that chronicles his journey from a skeptic to a believer. He says this, Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. At this very moment, I trust you as Savior and Lord. Make me the type of person you created me to be. You could pray something like that or those words in your own heart. And if you do that, don't leave before you tell somebody. Because that's the moment we're born again. When we call on the name of the Lord and are saved. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning and we thank you for the gospel. We thank you for our living hope, our heavenly inheritance. Help us to see everything through that light. And Lord, now as we close, I pray that if there be any here this morning that need to genuinely make that commitment and to receive forgiveness of sins, eternal life, the heavenly inheritance that you have prepared, I pray that today would be that day. And it's in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that we pray these things. Amen.